Welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to 7 Gen Live. We have an awesome show planned out today. Hope you guys are all having a great Friday so far. It's been a long week, so I'm just really happy that Friday is here. Hey Mike, how you doing? Loving your shirt. Thank you. Heck yeah. Shout out to nephew uh, Darren. Got, got my Darren's Delight shirt on. I told him I was rocking him on live today because he, he was getting all shy about it. So give him a <laughs> shout out. Yeah, yeah, doing good, man. I'm super happy it's Friday. This is a long week. I am normally not a person who like lives for the weekend, but this time I'm like very happy. <laughs> it's, <laughs> we're, we're almost at the end. It was, it was a long week. So how about you? What, you uh, more, what, what, um, do you guys have any more shirts available? I know some people were asking. I have to go ask nephew. Um, I think he had a couple like squirreled away. Um, okay. So I'll see. I know the sizes were limited too. So I'll, I'll post up after this and uh, let people know. Cool. Well, do you want to give everyone a little rundown about uh, what today's show is about? Yeah, totally. So title, we're talking about Sichangu contributions to regional economy and culture. What does that mean in, in, in actuality? Um, Basically, Rosebud and and you know uh, community members here we have a huge impact on the yeah the bigger economy and and the kind of uh, just the social life of of our entire region. So that includes down into Nebraska, that includes over into um, eastern parts of South Dakota and, and towns surrounding uh, Rosebud, but even as far out into Sioux Falls and into Rapid City and that kind of inspiration for the show actually came from some of the pieces. I don't know if, you know, whoever's been checking out on live, but, um, you know, kind of has come from some of the comments in, in recent weeks from coming out of uh, Rapid City around um, homelessness and, and issues in, in Rapid City. Um, some questionable comments made by, by the mayor up there and, uh, you know, kind of had a follow up with some of the people, some of the relatives from some Pine Ridge who, who went and visited with him. And it sparked for me this whole idea of like, do people even understand like all the awesome stuff that our community brings to the entire state, like in terms of how much shopping money goes to places and like keep some of these towns running. Um, and also just like all the awesome work that we, that we do in these, in these communities. Um, so I wanted to kind of like call on some people onto the show today to, to talk about that and specifically talk about some of Rosebud and, and you know, see Chungu country's contributions to the broader culture and economy of the state just to help shed some light there. Awesome. Well, I want to back up a little bit to um, some of the comments that Steve Allender made. He is the Rapid City Mayor. And in my opinion, they were very offensive. I also mm. thought they were kind of racist comments. And, you know, we won't talk about that specifically, but just some of the comments that he made, I mean, he said there was an influx of homelessness on the reservations and that many of the homeless natives are attracted to Rapid City because of their parks, the food that's available to them, and even the alcohol that's available to them. And I know that after that conference, that news conference, um, Nick Tilson actually sat down with Steve Allender and that was the the video you're speaking of that was live on Facebook and yep. they addressed it face to face but it doesn't seem like there was any sort of um, resolution Steve Allender didn't uh, apologize for his comments and he feels that he does he did nothing wrong and I know that he actually commented ab about um, he did have a response to that and he said it is a serious a serious problem and that this issue is time sensitive but he wouldn't rather not spend a bunch of time arguing whether or not he used the proper tone to describe the actual mm. issue so mm. i wasn't happy about that response at all but we could dive more into the issue i think it's a good time for us to go ahead and bring on our guests totally today we got our our featured guests they're waiting in the wings here uh Mike and Weezy, you guys ready to join on? Hey. Hey, Pray. Hey. Hey. Hey, hey all Julian. Right. Hello. So on the show, on We're the show happy today, to have you all here today. Heck yeah. We got 
Red Coast CEO, EZ Pong, Little Elk. We got uh, EDA Economic Development Specialist, Michael LaPointe. These are two of the smartest dudes I know. Two awesome, thoughtful guys over here. Prepare to be wowed and amazed. Michael LaPointe, he's a wizard with mathematics and 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 the whole nine. Uh, it's going to be a fun show. But hey, th thanks both of you for uh, for coming on today. Where, where are you both calling from? These are some interesting backgrounds we got going on here. Uh, I'm here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota right now, and I've been working with some census uh, staff here this week. The census thing has been kind of uh, taking up most of my time the last couple of weeks. We've got an extension to do our count in the country until October 31st, and I've just secured getting 20 more uh, enumerators to come out and help at Rosebud through a uh, strike team that focuses specifically on Indian country. So we just got word on that with the help of the uh, Rodney Bordeaux's office. Uh, I worked with them on behalf of Rodney to get this strike team to come on into Rosebud next week to uh, get about 660 more houses counted. We're about 85%, 84% uh, success rate on our 3,100 houses in Todd County. Uh, Millette County, uh, they're about done up there, they're focusing on the trust land. So we may actually get close to 100% this year uh, based on what we've been doing for the last uh, two or three months. As you know, Redco, going back a year ago, we knew how important it was to have every person counted when we're at about 15000 over $15,000 per person per year is what that count represents in federal resources. So we've Redco has really put a lot of emphasis uh, on getting that count completed and with the support and the leadership from Wheezy and uh, help early on from Katrina Fuller, uh, we've um, come a long way. And at this point, we're making sure that we uh, get as close to 100% of a count for all 31 households, 3,100 households as possible. So that's where I'm at right now. Just finished up a meeting with those folks about an hour ago and uh, call them from the parking lot actually. <laughs> Heck yeah, yeah viewers. Me. Yep, viewers strap in. Even in the intro, that is just knowledge dropping. So get ready. This is going to be an awesome, awesome show. Appreciate it, Mike. That's awesome. Uh, Weezy, what do you got going on lately? What, what are you doing today? Where are you at? Um, I'm, I'm at home and I'm going with a virtual background because I don't, people don't want to see my closet uh, <laughs> with, with some random shirts hanging up. So, so you got the, the virtual background, but that's, uh, just kind of in, in honor of, you know, we had had, had our, our first group of, of Buffalo come, you know, the, one of the first shows we talked about Buffalo and it'd be coming and, and, and we had our first relatives arrive yesterday. So I, I chose a Buffalo background to kind of celebrate that. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty pumped and, and excited. Heck yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I saw some videos floating around yesterday. How many Buffalo, where'd they come from? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a, uh, in agreement uh, with the uh, department, U.S. Department of Interior, and and so we're going to be receiving uh, buffalo from from National Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, yesterday and today, uh, we're bringing in our, our first group of of relatives, uh, fifty buffalo uh, from uh, Badlands National Park, and then later this month we have another fifty uh, that'll be arriving from Theodore Roosevelt Park. And uh, this is you know just the the first first year of a five-year plan to, to build this buffalo herd and uh you know man they look magnificent my 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 little guy was there my seven-year-old and uh <laughs> he said he said there's biggest trucks he said they look like trucks with legs so uh <laughs> yeah there's some there's some some powerful animals and uh you know we're buffalo people so so seeing them just gets you pumped and and one more thing I'd say, we're you know, as as the month progresses and as time progresses, we're going to be setting up some community days where, uh, if people want to come and welcome the buffalo, they can do that. Um, of course, in a, a, a safe socially distancing manner. So you know, we want to, you know, kind of limit the number of people at one time, but but we're going to open that up for people, um, so that you know, every everyone can can have an opportunity to to welcome our relatives. Awesome. Thank you for that cool update. It's super exciting project. Um, can't wait to get down there and check it out. Big, big day, big, big month. Um, yeah, so kind of you guys heard the intro, but talking a little bit. I mean, so, you know, it's something that I've thought about uh, 
you know, we've talked about kind of kicking it around the office and different things, but, you know, I, I think the, the, some of what, some of what the comments of what we were hearing and the flashpoint around that, you know, the conversations of, of up in Rapid City would kind of to really, to me, point to, you know, in general, it seems like there's always a lack of appreciation or understanding of actually how much Native nations, and, and I'm thinking Xichanglu country specifically, contributes to the economy and to the just the overall cultural and community well-being of, of the state and multi-states, yeah, you know, actually are, are bordering um, Nebraska. So I kind of wanted to bring both of you guys on to talk about that. I mean, uh, you know, running up, I don't even know if most people know, but Weezy, had, the story you tell of the conversations that you were having up when Redco was first op opening their offices in Rapid City always make me laugh because I think that's really indicative to, you know, kind of, kind of, how this goes down which is that we're not just here to have a little you know a nice little office but like rosebud's actually up creating a significant amount of jobs and economy in in rapid city in the black hills can you can you talk a little bit about that yeah yeah you know so so uh you know i think for, first it's important just to remember that you know what we're talking about is you know land of the, of the great sioux nation of the ocheti shakoni and, you know, as soon as you touch that, that east bank of the Missouri River and you go all the way from the east bank of the Missouri River, all the way to that western border where, where South Dakota and, and Wyoming, that border, that's all Lakota land. That's all Ocheti Shakomi land. That, that, that's, that's our territory. And so this, the, you know, we call it South Dakota, but this whole Western half of South Dakota, that's all ours by treaty. And, you know, the U.S. Constitution specifically states that treaties are the law of the land. And so if, if there is any single person who claims to be an American, a red-blooded American, anybody who, 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 who says, yes, I am a U.S. citizen, you got you, you got to honor the Constitution, and 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 you, which means you got to honor treaties and treaty rights. So you know that's the first thing that we always got to think about. So you know this is this is all all our, our territory, and you know we're gonna have to figure out you know a way forward and how we're going to um, uh, you know live and govern and create prosperity for everybody. But you know when we're talking about like this idea of like prosperity. Um, you know, I, I met with somebody in, in Rapid City and, and their comment was, you know, it's going to be go great. You know, you're going to have like your, your construction company and you'll be able to bring some guys from the reservation up to do some work in Rapid City. And we're like, yeah, you know, we'll we'll bring some folks from, you know, Sichangu territory to, to Rapid City area to do some work. But, you know, at the same time, we're also going to be creating a lot of jobs here and we're creating a lot of jobs, jobs in, in South Dakota. Um, and, and we're creating jobs that didn't exist before. We're creating opportunity that didn't exist before and bringing resources. So that's always kind of our starting point. Like, hey, th this is our land um, and, and we're bringing a lot to the table. So, you know, it, let, let's just be honest about that. Let's make sure we're honoring the US constitution um, and, and let's be smart about how we move forward from an economic standpoint. Totally. Yeah. No, that, I, I think that's dead on. Um, and being able to kind of, you know, for some reason there, there's not a culture in, in the broader, you know, state of, of celebrating those contributions and of, of, of saying, yeah, it's positive. It helps everyone. It isn't just a, a you know, see Chung, you know, rest of South Dakota issue. It everybody kind of elevates when we can create these kinds of kinds of opportunities so I, I know mike you've done an enormous enormous amount of economic econometric boom there it is i almost stumbled, stumbled over that one a little bit but econometric data really doing you know economy models and, and and thinking about finance models for the entire region you know really tracking how much money comes in and then also leaves the reservation at the charlie towns can you, just like talk a little bit about that, kind of like give us the background. What what is Rosebud and Sichangu country's contribution to 
the, the broader region, you know, speaking from a, from a, a dollar standpoint? Well, that's, that's, thank you for the question, Mike. Uh, the thing that really stands out for me when I took a look at Pennington County specifically, uh, I mean, the way we measure value in terms of our contributions to the state, uh, to Pennington County, Rapid City, uh, it, our neighbors to the south, north of us, we, we look at dollar transactions. You know, we take a look at what type of income people are earning, what type of uh, spending goes on with those earnings, where it takes place at, uh, the ripple effects that take place. South Dakota, for the most part, averages right now about $41 billion uh, in uh, economic output. That's the value of all the goods and services produced in the state. Uh, Pennington County, uh, at last look from the data that I have, uh, is about six billion fifty-two million dollars in economic output, meaning it's the value of all the goods and services that were produced there uh, at our last data set, which would be about two years ago. Uh, there's always a lag with the data when you when federal and state federal tax returns are filed and government agencies report payments and, and taxes received uh, for that activity. Now, having said that, when you got to focusing on a contribution to, let's say, for example, just the Pennington County, you your average per person output, the value of income and the value of goods and services they produce, whether they're in the uh, working for Ellsworth Air Force Base, whether they're working at Sioux San, whether they're working at the mall or one of the restaurants in town, the average per person for 113,775 people in the county is about $53,198. Pennington County as a whole has about 10.2% Native American population. And so you're looking at talking about about 11,600 people approximately. Of that, uh, at my last estimate, about 38% of those are people from, from Rosebud. That's on a high end. It'll drop a little bit. It could go as low as about 32, 31%. But I've seen it as high as 38%, uh, which is about 4,409 people. When you factor in and apply the average per person a contribution of about 53,000 uh, for all Native Americans there in the county, that's about $617.3 million contributed. And even if somebody, that, that's somebody who's working full-time at a job, that's somebody who is working you know, part-time, or somebody's not working at all, even if somebody isn't working or employed, they're still getting health care. Maybe they're stay-at-home moms or parents, and you know, they got their kids going to school, and they're still, you know, having the ability to produce value of goods and services, whether it's a rental voucher, or section eight. A landlord in Rapid City is gonna get eight hundred thousand dollars a month of rent just from you know, somebody who may be from Rosebud or from Pine Ridge or Eagle Butte getting that dollar value from them living there, whether it's subsidized housing, Lakota Homes or anywhere, whether it's uh, EBT, the spending that goes on at the grocery stores, uh, there, there's all these economic impacts, the Medicaid dollars that come in per person, even for our lowest income tribal members there, has an impact on the Rapid City healthcare system, which all in turn contributes to that tax base for the mayor's city, for the county's county commissioners, uh, who in turn are able to subsidize and fund everything they need to do within that, within their jurisdiction there. Now, when we add all that up, from everybody, that average output is 53,000 per person. For our tribal members, it's about $234.5 million that we contribute to Allender's coffers every year. And so Dang. that's just the people living there, all right? We still yep. have people that work down here, here at home in Rosebud, who, you know, we have 3,800 full-time employees, basically, a uh, quarter of a billion dollars in personal income from our, our wages, and 86% of that money leaves. And a lot of it goes to Rapid City. It'll go to Pier. Uh, we go to Watiki on any given weekend, but at least pre-COVID, you'll see how many people uh fill that place, contribute to the economic well-being of Rapid City. Lakota Nation Tournament, the economic impact of that. They don't want to lose that when there was horrible treatment going on there against our people. Uh, the talk of that leaving, going elsewhere. Well, you saw some reconciliation efforts really take place there. 
You know, I think that was before Allender's time. But uh, having said that, there's this recognition that goes on uh, with, I'll speak for uh, about Rapid City in Paynton County, that we have this impact. We contribute to that $6 billion economic output. For us, you know, we're talking almost, you know, quarter of a billion dollars just from Rosebud alone, people living there on top of what we're going to spend going over there every month. That's a whole nother analysis. Totally. Yeah, we, that is, that is mind blowing. We, we, we was just mentioning, uh, kind of messaging over here and, and maybe you could jump in here too, but talking about that, you know, on average, on a daily basis, that the population of Native Americans in Rapid City doubles every day from the nighttime to the daytime, which which indicates what? That we have an enormous amount of basically travel and visitors to the city, economically contributing, and then leaving. So the, the actual population in the city is really only a fraction of the actual funding brought into the community from, from Native communities. It, it might... Um, Jillian, like we, we did a study a few years ago and, and we just, you know, kind of, we're just asking people, you know, where, where do you spend your money and where do you spend your, what do you spend your money on? And, you know, of the people that, that were surveyed, you know, across, across our, our native nation, about $528 per month was spent at the Rapid City Walmart per family, per family, you know, so, you know, that might've gone up a little bit, might've gone down a little bit, but, but basically, you know, every single family here in Rosebud at, at some time, even during COVID during is going to be going up to Rapid City sometime during the month, you know, and drop in hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And you know, I don't know what that total is, but if you're Rapid City sale, I, I bet that even just from Rosebud, it's probably a hundred million dollars. You know, you 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 factor out, you know, everyone's spending over there over the course of a year. And you know, at a at a two percent sales tax, if we spend a hundred million dollars, that's two million dollars, that's two million dollars that we're contributing. That's just rosebud. Then you add in, you know, so you add in the other tribes and, you know, Pine Ridge, which is, you know, got more people than us that probably spends more money there because they're closer. I mean, it is significant amounts of, of money that, that's going into that, that tax base. Yeah, just to give an example, I mean, personally, I save, uh, I make a list of everything that I need. And at the end of the month, I go to Rapid City, Walmart and buy my groceries, buy all my household goods there. So I know exactly what you mean by that. But what are some of the first steps that we have to do here on our reservation to get people to shop here and grow our economy? How do we even move forward from this? The, the, I'll chime in right there, Jillian. Uh, just going to add real quickly, and it'll lead to your question. Uh, when you We've got about 3,800 full-time employees here at Rosebud alone. And then we let's just say 1,500 of them go up and spend, like Weezy was saying, which is roughly about $6,000 per year at Walmart alone. That's, over, that's $9 million uh, just a year, just on that. That doesn't count hotel. That doesn't count the food and dining uh, that, that goes on, the entertainment that takes place. So you add the multiplier effect, you know, you're, you know, you're talking – uh, a, a significant amount of impact there. So really what, what has to happen is you take a look at the data. You know, there's an old saying, I believe it, and numbers don't lie. And when you look at the numbers of where our own money goes and 86% of quarter of a billion dollars leaves every year, uh, we, we just, we're losing and hemorrhaging our own ability to, to sustain ourselves and develop ourselves and create jobs and income for, and wealth for people here at home. When, every time we leave, but we have nowhere to go except rapid, except here, uh, whether it's once a month or even for some people every couple of weeks on payday. So it, it starts by doing the analysis of looking at, you know, what's happening now, just an assessment, the same way you would look at your own, you know, your own health, your own body, you know, what's my blood pressure, what's my, old, my O2 rates, oxygen sensors, how's my sugar levels, you start looking at things as a human body, you, you can develop a, a strategic plan to assess it and get healthy. That's really the same thing we're, we're doing right now with our own economy. 
even in this COVID environment, we're still doing a lot of great things remotely. And some of the initial analysis that Weezy's led and developed going back the last few years uh, at Kale Walk Paula is tying into that now where we look at what is sustainable? What, what can we actually prove mathematically that will work, that people will, where people will spend, what will they buy? And at this point, uh, it's all about getting that marketing effort and allowing Weezy the opportunity to go get his networks, uh, go approach them, those uh, folks who can help do the capital investments, uh, the legal infrastructure, uh, the UCC is being worked on. Our attorney general has to give us comments on that. We're going to need the, the ability to record uh, transactions on trust land. But having said all that, those things are happening right now. I, I, I want to kind of just chime in. You know, Mike, Mike mentioned having a legal infrastructure. So that's actually a really big thing. Um, you know, if you have a business on tribal land, and uh, something happens there, somebody violates a contract, um, you need to be able to enforce that. And having a uniform commercial code is what it's called, uniform commercial code. Having a uniform commercial code so that businesses know that they're protected from a legal standpoint is huge. And then in order to access money, if you wanna borrow money, you, you have to have what's called a secured transactions code. Those are two big, big pieces of the, the economic infrastructure in order to create small businesses. And I'm pretty, pretty excited that, you know, we, we, those two codes have been written, developed, and, and they're being reviewed right now. Um, some of the, the leadership in the tribe. And, and I think that, that when we're able to, to get those passed, that that's going to be a, a big piece of the puzzle to start generating more and more kind of local business. business. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you both. I don't know, viewers, if you're looking over there, Mike said he's just starting to heat up. He said sweatshirt's coming off. We're, we're getting rolling here. We're on 7 Gen Live. We got Mike LaPointe. Uh, EDA specialist from Tribe. Awesome, amazing economic and numbers mind. We got Wizeep Little Elk, CEO of Redco. Uh, we're talking Sichangu contributions to the broader economy and community culture of South Dakota, of, of our, our surrounding region. Um, you know, personally, Julian, I don't know about you. I'm not an, I'm not an enormous numbers guy. Okay, I was like a philosophy major. I was way more on the... Uh, really long prose written texts. Um, but I have come to have a huge appreciation for Mike's mind and the, and the way that he brings issues. And, and I think there is, you know, last year on um, the push to get um, community-based school legislation, charter school legislation passed in the state of South Dakota, Mike blew my mind with uh, uh, economic projection of basically the financial savings that, that South Dakota as a broader state would actually have by passing this legislation over the next generations. Um, it was amazing. And Mike, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And, and really like, why are you so passionate about numbers? Like, what do you see the role of numbers and this, this sort of modeling being for indigenous communities to be able to take back power in some of these conversations that we're, that we're having? Well, I appreciate the, uh, the your your kind words and, and comments there, Prate. That's uh, uh, very humbling to hear that coming from you. And what I'll say is that, uh, it, that again, numbers don't lie, and oftentimes it's really hard to know if you're being successful at something, whether it's something on an individual level, as simple as getting your A1C from, let's say, an outrageous number of 12 to 15 to a manageable level of, you know, a great level of 5.8 or less where you're no longer considered diabetic, or if it's a matter of getting your um, blood pressure down to a normal level of 120 over 80 versus people who may be in the high 160s over 90s and already have a stroke. Numbers matter. And even though we may not often know it, you know, at the end of the day back home here, we really are impacted by numbers, whether it's, you know, maybe you're only bringing in four or $500 a month in income. 
Maybe you're fortunate enough to make four or 5,000 a month in income. Numbers matter. And we often, as a society, kind of touching up on what Weezy was saying, talking about our treaty uh, boundaries, pre treaty days, uh, our economies were such that we had everything we needed to be able to meet the needs of people uh, for every generation. And when you take a look at how and why we suffer from the the disparities, the health-wise, the economic-wise, the poverty, the death rates that may be higher, suicides have always been an issue for us. You know, why don't you want to live? You know, when you have so much to offer the world, you know, that sense of hopelessness. What is it for me? I've looked at it from the economics perspective, where we often have not had the opportunity to meet our own basic needs, and as a result of that, you get some really dysfunctional behaviors. And so for me, the passion was born out of wanting to create wealth and opportunity for people here at home. It was just that simple. So uh, economics gave that opportunity to be able to systemically look at how you can actually do that. You have to have the ability to, uh, much like a doctor would, assess someone's health, current health state, to be able to do something about it. It's the same with econometricians, economists. Um, having to do the same thing. So I'll take those principles and do my best to apply them. You mentioned the um, the school charter legislation. You know, it, it that one just kind of mathematically proved to us that for every dollar, you're going to get this huge, enormous payback for people not being stuck on uh, welfare or on state programs. 14,000 people, half our population gets food stamps. You know, so almost half gets Medicaid from the state. We talk about sovereignty, yet we're really dependent upon uh, the state of South Dakota for so much of our basic human health care and food needs, nutrition needs. So numbers matter. You know, you want to be able to invest in things that get us, get our numbers better, our health numbers. So the Buffalo Project, at some point, when our bison herd is up to where we can basically use them for all nutritional needs, that's going to be huge. That's going to get us back to a point where 200 years ago, we were used to a leaner, healthier diet that wasn't so carbohydrate based and get our numbers down. That's this, this is the seeds that are being planted. The school that Sage is working on and, and got started at some point is going to be able to get our kids along into an educational system that increases economic output. They're gonna learn more, it's gonna be relevant. It's gonna be, they're not gonna be chastised for uh, knowing their culture, practicing it or anything that may happen negatively to them in the outside school district, or even within our own school districts that have happened in the past. And I can say that as a former product of Todd County, we often don't even get treated right. So having said all those things, uh, it's, it's all about making people's lives better. That's why the numbers matter. You know, you want to be able to, and whether people know it or not, we're all a part of this. We're either part of, of the, the problem or part of the solution here at home. And the more we know about incremental success, even if it's just 1%, one month over a month, uh, over the next month, or 1% gain in health, our economic numbers, our income increases per year. It's better that that adds up. There's these old, there's these old psychologists that talk about, you know, in terms of success, that 1% tends to be the goal you want to get, even if it's day over day, week over week, month over month, whatever in business or whatever endeavor you're in, you want to track that. That's why numbers matter. You want to be able to uh, know if you're making a difference or not. Sure, we're in the top 10 poorest counties 20, 30 years ago. I know we went up. I know Redco has a lot to do with that. At some point, why can't we be the top 10 incomes out of 3,110 counties in the U.S.? So numbers matter. They allow us to track our progress. Right. Kind of just like building on that that idea that, that numbers matter. Like, I, I think when you look at things from a historical perspective, it it can be kind of shocking. And you know, when you look at the the millions of acres of land that were stolen from us, and the the money that was generated on that land, you know, it's it's billions and trillions of dollars. When you look at just Buffalo, for example, 
And, you know, you, you look at, at, you know, between 60 and 100 million buffalo killed, slaughtered. And the economic loss of what that meant to us. I mean, there was a, a, a massive, you know, it was, it was a genocide. It was a cultural genocide and a spiritual genocide. But if we were to put that into numbers that be, and, and put it into today's dollars, you're talking trillions of dollars of wealth that was just pulled and extracted from Native American hands and lands. And, and so, you know, sometimes people, you know, you hear politicians or whatnot, you know, they start talking about, oh, you know, all the Indians are on welfare and, you know, all the Indians, uh, you know, they just have their hands out. Well, you know what? Through treaty, we gave millions of acres of land to the United States so that they could have a home and a nation. And then millions of acres of land was stolen from us and trillions of dollars of wealth was taken from us. And, and if we had what we were supposed to have, if, the, if, the, if we just honored the U.S. Constitution treaty, U.S. Constitution and honored our treaties, we'd be, be in good shape. And, you know, I think that, the, the, that our allies and the people that would be living here would also be pretty happy as well, because I know Indians don't like being taxed. And, and if, if, we, if these lands were under native jurisdiction, tax rates would be lower than what they are now. Like, like I can pretty much guarantee that. <laughs> so Mike, would you say, Mike LaPointe, would you say that we have had progression over the years as far as our economy locally? It has it been massive or do you think it could be, do you think it could be progressing a lot quicker if we were doing something different? Well, I'll be rather be right to the point and keep it simple. Uh, we still have money hemorrhaging out of the, out of uh, our area, out of our reservation. We're still, you know, at 86%. I've seen it drop down to 82% where about 18% of the money stayed when gas prices shot up to about almost $5 a gallon in about 2003, 2005 that time frame uh, but when if so if gas prices go high we tend to spend more because we don't care to drive so far you know all the way to rapid pier or even valentine it's it's the more less income you make the harder it is to drive so over the years for the most part uh with the we with the exception of what redco's done over the last five or six years things have been the same Redco is taking what needs to be done in terms of infrastructure and the, the basically the, the seedlings of what needs to happen to grow our economy and is doing something about it. You hear a lot of talk from a lot of people, you know, local and statewide and nationwide politicians or otherwise uh, wanting to do something. But this, if, this, if this were that easy, it would have been done long, long, long time ago. Right. So at this point with what Weezy and the Red Coal Board and what they've done over the past few years is really just identify what they know needs to be done and it's being done. We're all doing it. We're all having a, a role to play in this, whether it's the legal stuff, whether it's the studies, you know, it, it's all about a targeted focused effort. You can either do a shotgun approach and hope some of your pellets hit the target, or you can rifle in and zoom in you know, whether you're 500 yards out or a thousand yards out and, and hit your target. We're rifling in right now. It's, it's, we wish we could do things quicker. I know Weezy wanted to do all this stuff yesterday, uh, but the reality is it, it does take time to manifest. And in this environment with COVID, the way I envision it is that we should have an accelerated economy developed to a point where uh, we can sustain and survive ourselves from this, this outbreak and anything beyond that. When this next one happens, and because of climate change and all the other things going on in this world, viruses like this are going to keep popping up. Mike, you're on mute. Mike. 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 <laughs> You're on mute. You accidentally okay, muted here. yourself. Okay, <laughs> he that. said his, his phone got too fired up and had a sensor him almost like, hold on, you're bringing a lot of Yeah, I started right going off a tangent. <laughs> All right, so I'll just summarize what I said right there. But basically, uh, we're doing what needs to be done now. 
and there's there's no more time to wait. Too many people's health and well-being is at stake right now. So it's it's time to to develop what we need to do. Keep our money at home. Keep it circulating. Uh, make sure we take care of our relatives. Be good neighbors to each other. And that starts by making sure people's basic human needs are met, basic economic needs are met, and we're we're doing that right now. So following following up on that, I feel like one of the biggest things that we can do is just help empower people to understand the impact of their economic spending. So you were kind of at the end, you're talking about circulating money within the community. That's a giant principle of local economic development, you know, in the, in the local food space. So I spend a lot of time there. I talk about that a lot of like turning dollars over within your community. Um, the idea that if you get a dollar and you spend it, at a local institution and then that person spends it at another local institution and right like turning it over within the community putting that money to work for you in multiple ways can you talk a little bit about that in terms of you know i've heard you say that some money we don't ever turn over even once a dollar comes in and immediately leaves it comes here and then it immediately goes to rapid city so we don't build any wealth there what is rosebud's current economic output and what would the impact be if we were able to actually turn those dollars over, say, five times? What What is the difference in, in wealth right. generation and, and economic development? So in a nutshell, our last economic output data, we have at $688 million and all the value of everything that was produced and created. That's the tribe spending, St. Francis Indian School, TLE, Todd County School District. Uh, all the employees spending that took place within the, uh, uh, the county, the wages paid out, 688 million. And if, if every one of those dollars were able to turn five times, the, the rule is that you wanted your dollar to turn five times in any healthy economy before it leaves. And if we did that, we'd have a three and a half billion dollar economy. Uh, we, we'd have about it looks like from my last analysis, about 8,000 jobs. You know, you'd add about another 4,500 people to payrolls. Okay, just meet, just to supply what you have to leave the reservation for, uh, but also looking at just trying to meet some regional demand for, for certain things. For, so uh, statewide uh, demand for certain goods and services. So it, that's where you want to go. And what the, the sad part is out of that, quarter of a billion dollars in personal income and wages that's paid. That's not just employment, but that's social security, retirement, SSI, all these subsidies that we may get that are cash-based, EBT. You know, again, 86% leaves. We, we barely, we don't even get a full turn of that dollar locally because it's so bad. That's how bad it is. It, it, it'd be like your body losing 86% of its blood at a given time. How are you going to survive? And it's no wonder why we have all the problems we do. No human body can survive with 86% blood loss. And then all of a sudden get replenished one or two times a month or maybe a couple of payrolls every uh, every month and come back to life. That That's essentially what we're doing. And I've often wondered, you know, if, and intuitively that a lot of the our, our crime, our statistics, our drug and alcohol abuse uh, uh, that may occur, that is occurring, it, it ties into the distress of people suffering, you know, really economically, there's not enough needs met. And, and so from my perspective, I know people have different views on it and it's different tangents by which they look at our problems. I look at it through the economic lens and try to explain it that way, that when you can't meet what people need to survive, they're under duress. And it's going to cause a lot. So the goal then is to try to get that dollar turned five times. You know, whereas Walmart, their model in Rapid City, they, they collect sales. They'll take $9 million from our Rosemary Sioux tribal members' money and uh, go up there every couple of weeks or once a month. And it goes to Bentonville, Arkansas. It goes to the Walmart family uh, or the Walton family. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, it, and they're the ones that benefit from that. It, it literally goes, it's some. It's tallied up at the end of the day of every shift and they get the cash out report every day in Bentonville and the CEO gets it the next morning on his desk. Uh, they're in Bentonville and they know what they have. So we have to think about those things. There's gonna be trade-offs and decisions. Do we want an anchor store that will bring a lot of people like Walmart you know, into the Rosebud or do you start your own that basically meets those needs? Uh, you, you start, once you have the information, 
once you have data, once you know what a business plan looks like versus a, in a what if scenario versus a Walmart versus a, a private owned one by let's say Red Core or somebody else in the community or the outside community, then you can make decisions. But either way, what has to happen, Mike, is you have to have the ability to sell the things that people need to live, work, and play. It's not that complicated. They need good, healthy food. It has to be affordable and good quality. They need to buy clothes and, and, and goods and supplies for their kids and their grandparents and themselves. You have to have the ability to get entertained, you know, to go to movies, you know, to be able to go to the water park. If you can meet all those elements that we've identified in some of the matrix works that I've looked at and I've developed, then you know what should be there. Then you know. So uh, again, get the dollar to turn five times. If you can get to seven or eight, that's even perfect. You know, so some of that analysis is ongoing now. That'll be ready by the end of the year in terms of more targeted industry industry analysis. Right now, we're just looking at what what the need is, but then you want to get more tac tactical about it and say, as part of the overall strategy, which one should we do? Here's the the direct, in, indirect, and induced economic benefits that spill over throughout the whole community, which one should we choose? That's that's where we want to be able to make those decisions as well. The one and only Michael Appoint. Michael Appoint for mayor, everyone. That's what, that's what I'm here for. Mike, Michael Appoint for, for uh, yeah, for, for everything. I love it. You know, for anyone who doesn't know, also, Mike was predicting the rise of uh, COVID like three months before this whole thing even happened. He was in the office talking about tra tracking different charts. I was like, if Mike was ahead of uh, South Dakota's task force team, we would have been fine. Uh, right now, here we are still bragging about no lockdowns while cases spike. I'm like, Put Mike in there, okay? Like <laughs> Everybody said, get out of here. Don't get lie. He knew get it. Out. He knew it. <laughs> Get out of the way hey, Mike, real quick, man. though, I do have a question about, you know, um, our entertainment industry. Uh, we don't have any entertainment here. Not a lot, actually. And we used to have a theater. We used to have a bowling alley. We used to have a restaurant. Why is it that those things keep going away? It, in a nutshell, we don't have a lot of families at home who were raised that way. We don't, we don't even have a lot of first generation home buyers or first time home buyers. And so you take a look at the makeup of who owns businesses in Mission or in Rosebud with the exception of some prominent families like the Valandras, the Clones, or some of the Bordeaux's or Mike Bolts. Uh, you really don't have a whole lot of, or even there's some ranchers, you got some ranchers out there, I'll give them, there's some operations out there that they have. But let's just look at the city of Mission. You, just the, the the bowling alley was owned by the Joneses. Uh, Jones Lumberyard is closed now. Uh, you you take a look and you just don't have the culture and the ability you know, within your own our own tribe to pass those things down. All right. So that's one. Number two, what you see even in Valentine, Nebraska now, with the 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 guy who sold the theater that was bringing in eight hundred thousand dollars a year. There was eight people on the payroll there when I looked at the uh, numbers for. Uh, the movie theater industry in the city of Valentine. Uh, if we had our own, my numbers, I show about 1.2 million in sales. But do we have people who uh, can actually start one and run one and have the equity and the credit needed to go walk into the bank there in Mission and put 30% down and say, I want the other 70% from the bank? Not a whole lot. But there again, it goes back to what Weezy and Redco have done over the last few years, getting, you know, the... Uh, the CDFI, Community Development Institution, uh, Financial Institution, CDFI, uh, component developed to do the uh, lending and also the business coaching. We're still focusing on creating that culture where we have business owners, you know, and Weezy says this, that we shouldn't own everything. And you're right, we shouldn't. Uh, you and I should maybe at some point, somebody else own a theater, get that thing started uh, and make sure kids' entertainment needs are met. Families have somewhere to go. Uh, it's we're not all about the casino, you know, the entertainment budget, the analysis that I've had on that thing, maybe about four million dollars is spent by us at the casino, about another eight million, actually about six and a half million is goes and leaves the area because we don't have a bowling alley. We don't have a state of the art one and they've got some really neat ones out in the five state area that I've visited and seen electronic scoreboards, great music, good disco lights, good food. Um, 
it's it's amazing. The water parks are a whole other thing, indoor, outdoor, spring, winter, fall, having a water park for our families. Uh, this notion out there with uh, non-Indian communities or the mayor's office that, you know, alcohol and drug abuse is rampant. You know, we don't, as a people, when I look at the numbers of the sales that took place out to the uh, Old Prairie Hills place and compared it to five state region area of other of, of drinking by alcohol by consumers, we don't drink any more than, than nine uh, native people. So this notion is it's, it's false that we're, you know, that we abuse alcohol or that we, you know, it'd be drink more of it than anyone else. That's not true. So, but we just don't have nowhere to spend our money. We're not looking for bars and casinos to go gamble our money away and, you know, and, and create economic instability, dysfunction in our families. We need healthy, safe places for kids and families to go. Take grandma, take the kids. And we can do that. Why don't we have it? Because we just didn't have the culture for it. We were literally oppressed, told what, how to, by the government officials for, you know, 100 years ago, reservations first started. What we could say, how we could talk, we couldn't use our language, we couldn't pray in our own way. And in America, in a place like America, you know, that's absurd because of the country based on freedom of religion and freedom of speech. When you can't talk your own language, you can't pray your own way. That's absurd. Why are we business owners? Because we had our freedom taken from us. We were never allowed to trade. We had healthy economies. We had property rights. We had all the good social service systems in place for people who couldn't provide for their families if they lost someone in a hunting accident or in a battle. We had all those things pre-reservation days. Uh, it was taken from us. Uh, and we basically couldn't do for ourselves anymore. Now we have to build that back. And we have to set the example through Red Cove, through the Suchango CDC, and through our own outreach efforts with our local partners, with the tribe and our entities, uh, with the school that Sage is running, that started with Wheezy. You know, we, we need to do that from the ground up from scratch and let it build and over time in our lifetimes, see the success bear out. I love that. I love the energy and the, the clarity on that answer. And for any of you viewers who are entrepreneurs, Mike was talking about a bowling alley, but if you heard him in there, he, he was really talking about a disco party. So any of you who are looking to start a disco party <laughs> dance hall, Mike LaPointe's going to be down here tearing it up every weekend. <laughs> He's got money to burn, he said. He tears it up at the gym, so I can imagine at the dance floor. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yep, totally. <laughs> Well, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're, we're wrapping up here at the end of our hour as a quick hour. Um, really appreciate both of you coming on and, and talking about this and, and enlightening us. What, um, you know, kind of the end, like each of you last parting words, you know, what, what's your recommendation? What's the first concrete thing that you want to send out to anybody watching this? So what, what, how can we start having an impact and, and shifting things towards, you know, Weezy, I've heard you talk about this idea of uh, the new Lakota economy. How do we start bringing that into fruition today? So I think first, every single one of us can start spending more money locally, right? You know, hey, I go to Valentine, you know, I'll spend some money there, but, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you know, spend it at one of the grocery stores here. Um, and maybe you do that once a month and you start training yourself to do that so that we start turning more and more dollars over here. The second is we got to start telling stories. We got to tell stories about our rebirth and our regeneration and how we're going to reclaim our sovereignty and reclaim our identity and, and reclaim the, the prosperity that we used to have. That's the first thing is, is just saying, you know what? Um, we can get beyond this and, you know, get out of that poverty mindset, get out of that hang around the fort mindset, you know, that that's the past that this is, this is, is where we want to go. This is where, you know, people talk about the seventh generation all the time. Well, the seventh generation isn't just going to be the, this magical group of kids that are born that with these golden children that are just going to be born and rise up. We got to create the conditions for them. We got to create the, the an opportunity for them to thrive. And that is a responsibility that every single one of us has. And, and so, you know, hopefully, and, and I believe it, that, the, that we need to, we're going to see more and more youth rising up and, and doing good stuff. 
We need more 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 kids going off to 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 college. We need more people getting their business degrees, getting their their business MBA degrees, and then coming back. You know, that's the big thing. Is we is, is you know go get your education and come back. And and if you got to struggle through it, that that's okay. That's just part of your generation and what you got to go through. Um, every every generation has a challenge. Every generation has struggles. And let's just be thankful that that our struggles are, you know, don't entail getting hunted hunted down by cavalry. You know, we, we don't we don't have to go through a wounded knee. You know, if 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 the worst that we have to do is is go through, you know, somebody criticizing you for having a degree, awesome. You are lucky. So so we just got to get 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 into that kind of positive mindset and and get moving and say, you know what, we are the masters of our own fate. We're gonna change things. Awesome, thank you. What do you got, Mike? What do you want to leave people with? You know, and and what I'll say, and this is probably a little different tangent for an economist numbers guy here, but I'm gonna ask people to pray, to pray for clarity in their own lives and for those around them and for the their families and their friends, so that and their loved ones, so they can stay focused. Right now, more than ever, I believe if we keep our minds focused on being good parents, grandparents, good relatives, good cousins, friends, that by doing that, we're going to be able to stay focused and make better decisions about uh, our own lives. And how that translates into an economy is when you're focused and you're balanced, you're, you're not going to become a burden. To those around you, if you can't, if you don't have the ability to take care of yourselves uh, and make a bad decision, people drink and drive, and all of a sudden somebody gets hurt or killed, and now you ruin some uh, family all because you felt bad because you didn't have a job and you wanted to go out and drink and forget about things. No, focus, pray. We're going to do what we have to do on our end with Redco and its partners to be able to bring opportunities for people so that needs are met, so that. If you're feeling down, you're feeling out, you're stressed economically, and you feel like giving up on yourself or those around you, that you don't fall into making bad choices. I'm going to ask people to pray for clarity in their own lives right now. However they pray, I don't care if you go to Catholic Church, you're Luther, you're Episcopal, you go to our Nepes, you go to our ceremonies, however you pray, you just do it. I'm going to ask people to do that now more than ever, because you're all going to be part of the solution to getting out of poverty. You're all going to have a role to play. We're going to be advertising for jobs here in the next, within, realistically, probably about a year to three years. You're going to see just this growing number of opportunities, whether it's a, a private employer that we help get to the table and get set up on that Turtle Creek at the, at the Kaywalk Pala or elsewhere. But you're going to be asked to contribute something, whether we, you know, you take on a job training program or whether it's even spending money at one of the new restaurants you know, during these COVID times or not. Do we build? Make sure we want that opportunity to be there, but we have to have people with real clear minds and, and in order to be able to partake in that. I don't want to see people lost any more than what we've had over the decades uh, to uh, bad decisions. Uh, where our population is growing. You asked earlier uh, about opportunity. Our growth rate is just phenomenal. It's, it's just we're one of the few places in the state, all of in the country, in fact, that keeps growing and growing. Uh, but if we're going to create that opportunity and and do some of the things that a lot of the things that we've all talked about here today, then you've got to have a clear mind and there will be opportunities for you. Just like Weezy was saying, whether you're educated or not, whether you're old or young, uh, we've got to keep our minds clear and what God, what Takashi gave us to be able to uh, to do good in this world and leave something better behind for our kids and grandkids. Awesome. Really great words. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Weezy. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Weezy doing it from his closet, aka the buffalo in his closet. Mike doing it from the parking lot. We appreciate you both so much. I want to remind everybody that Monday, October 12th is Indigenous Peoples Day. And Monday, you're going to be on a panel, correct, Weezy? Two panels. Two panels. Two, pan yeah, two, two, two of them going on. All right, where can people watch those? 
Um, they will be shared on the Sichungu CDC Facebook. So the same place you, you come to get this information, we're going to have links there for, for people to check that out. Awesome. All right. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. And to our watchers out there, remember the show is every Friday at one o'clock. Don't forget to host a watch party and share this video. And that's it for today. We're going we're gonna to cut it off right there. We'll talk to you guys soon. Doksha. Oh. Doksha. Doksha. Uh, take care. Be safe. See you, Mike. Bye.